Welcome to the Washington Tattoo Podcast, where we champion education, celebrate community, and unite the very best of humanity. Fueled by world-class military precision and cultural excellence, the Washington Tattoo produces unforgettable immersive experiences, creating an atmosphere for people, organizations, and businesses to connect, network, and build impactful relationships. We invite you to listen to this episode of the Washington Tattoo Podcast, where the world's musical traditions come to life. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Washington Tattoo Podcast. I have my wonderful co-host, Stu Warrington, on the other side of the pond. Stu, how are you doing this afternoon? Not too bad. The sun's out, but for some unknown reason, I'm full of cold. I mean, it's just typical, isn't it? So uh, we've waited so long for the sun to come out, and as soon as it comes out, I'm, I'm jammed full of cold. So I'll see how I get on today. Incredible. Well, I hope you feel better, my friend. And I know today's conversation is definitely going to make you feel better, because I'm already feeling better just talking with Joy pr- before the show. So today's a super special episode. We've got Joy Dunlop. She's a Scottish broadcaster, singer, step dancer, and educator. She performs mainly folk music and Scottish uh, Scottish dance, as well as contemporary styles. And she is also a presenter with BBC Scotland and BBC Alba, and is a huge, huge proponent of Gaelic singing and Gaelic speaking uh, in the Scottish tradition. So today... Really wanted to give a great warm welcome to Joy, and we met each other at New York Tartan Week uh, not too long ago. I just want to say, Joy, thank you so much for helping us uh, with this podcast episode. No, thank you very much for having me, and it's uh, lovely to see you again, albeit on the other side of a screen this time. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent, excellent. So, uh, honestly, just want to really get started with your upbringing. I mean, it's very unique. We, we have a passion for tradition. We have a passion for heritage. And obviously, the culture and the arts are a huge piece of that. But just your personal connection with Gaelic music and culture, how did you first get in contact with it? Well, I come from a tiny village in um, West Scotland called Connell, um, which nobody will have heard of because it is very, very small. But if you've ever heard of Oban where they have the whiskey and um, a lot of times if you go into the Isles, you go from Oban. So Argyll, the area that I'm from is sort of, I guess it's the bottom of the Scottish Highlands. And we are quite lucky that Gaelic language and culture, particularly music, is steeped in our community. So I grew up um, doing a lot of music, but doing both classical music and Gaelic traditional music. And I grew up competing in competitions, singing in Gaelic and reciting poetry and learning in school. But also my parents aren't Gaelic speakers. So I'm, I guess, uh, slightly different to some people from the Highlands and Islands in particular. I didn't, I wasn't brought up a Gaelic speaker. I learned it when I was slightly older, but it was definitely the music that pulled me in and it was quite natural at that time to not only sing in Gaelic and you know play traditional musical instruments but also learn maybe classical or pop or folk you know it it was music was just around us and everybody played or or sang and it didn't really seem like that special a thing in all honesty. That's amazing. I mean, so Stu, you also, I mean, growing up in the traditional music scene, and that's still a very big, that's a very big and important piece, I feel like, in the UK as keeping ties to tradition. So I mean, with your parents not being there, I know, Stu, your parents were heavily involved yeah. in the tradition as well. And so, Stu, did you also play traditional music as well as classical? Uh, <clears throat> sometimes. Uh you know, when, when I was in the, the territorial, ter, territorial Army Band, we, we played a whole range of different uh, styles. And, you know, we, we used to have Cayley bands and we used to have everything from jazz bands, function bands, and, you know, we used to get involved in everything. But predominantly it was all the traditional military-style music that, that you'd, you'd expect to find from a, yeah. uh, a typical marching-style band. But, you know, I mean, this is something I know absolutely nothing about. I'm going to be completely honest here, Joy, but it's something I've, yeah, I've, all, I've spent a lot of time in Scotland. Uh, I was in the Romans band and we were stationed up in Scotland. Uh, so we, we had a lot of Cayley bands. But the what I want to know is the the language. Do you have the like regional accents as well? Or is it 
is it the, is it the same or do they have regional accents as well or yeah no we've definitely got that um there are dialects our in scottish gaelic our dialects maybe aren't as distinct in as irish dialects and you often hear people in ireland say you know we don't understand each other because <laughs> you know, they come from here and somebody comes from somewhere else and it's all to do with their dialects are quite different whereas in scotland i would say we have more accents you can tell where somebody's from because they've got a twang and that's that twang that's local to their area but um like I don't have any problems understanding the Gaelic of somebody from Lewis or Barra or Northwest Highlands or cities because now um I think that's the the wonderful thing that we have seen regarding Scottish Gaelic is that people are really learning now all throughout Scotland and we have Gaelic medium education which means children that are taught through the medium of Gaelic, and that wow. has come alive in the cities in particular. So um, it's really interesting that you can now hear a fluent Gaelic speaker from Glasgow that speaks with a broad Glasgow accent. Wow, and that's I love, Personally, I love that. I think we need that. You know, we are, if you speak to anybody that's involved in minority language and culture, you'll know that you're pushing against the tide of English, which is all encompassing. Yeah. Everybody speaks English, it's all around you. So we need everybody, we need everything. And I yeah. kind of love it. <laughs> that um, now you're getting people coming and they have their own accent, they've got their, their own way of speaking. And it's not taken away from the tradition. The tradition is really important and should be treasured and should be preserved. But actually, you've got to push forward and you have to embrace new everything. So why not also new accents? So talking about embracing something new, has social media helped with this side of it, keeping the, the tradition oh. and the culture going? Absolutely. I mean, I think on so many fronts, I mean, we, the fact that we are doing this now and that we're in different parts of the globe is testament to the fact that with social media, the world is so much smaller. And that yeah. really comes into its own, I think, when you're talking about particularly minority languages and culture, because actually you can find like minded people throughout the world and you can talk to people and interact. And that's always the tricky thing when you're trying to learn in particular a minority language. It's how do you speak to somebody? If you are, for example, in the States, you're like, I want to learn Gaelic. Who do I speak to? You can't just turn to your neighbor. And actually, even in Scotland, we have the same problem. It's you can't turn to your neighbor and just speak to somebody. However, you can find somebody online, whether yeah. it's just, you know, chatting by text or whether it's online classes or whether it's um, songs or finding videos. It makes the world that wee bit smaller. And I think that's really special. And particularly, it's the one thing about lockdown, actually, that kind of came to the fore that the world was so much smaller and you could access um, people everywhere. You could find new friends throughout the globe. And when we were all holding, when we were holding Kayleigh's online and you could see that, whereas if I'm, you know, if I grew up going to, when I was wee, it was, a, it was we all went to the Cayleys in Tunnel. That was the next village along from us. You went into that wee village hall, people were there. And it was yeah. wonderful and phenomenal. But it was only the people who were in that room that were accessing <laughs> at that point that Cayley. Whereas when we were doing them online, all of a sudden, it was like, oh my goodness, actually, <laughs> people can come in from Australia or the States or even the, like, the next village. You were like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to drive there tonight. Suddenly they could come in. So they're good and bad things. So I think that actually online has really just broken down that geographical barrier that maybe yeah. was there beforehand. It's wonderful. And yeah, is that also perfect. helping reach the, a younger audience as well, getting from a younger age and educating them? And Absolutely, because you can... You can find anything online. In particular, the younger generations are so much more tech savvy. Like they know how to find anything. So they and they're and the wonder of social media is you the good and the bad thing of an algorithm is they show you what they think you might like. And sometimes that might be Gaelic. Like, okay, I'll have a look at that. I'll get involved in there. So um, there again, yeah, there are good and bad things, but you'll always find something. And actually that's when Gaelic can come to the fore, I think. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. no, it's been so special. I mean, honestly, in the last few years and seeing pandemic now, say <laughs> post pandemic and looking at New York and specifically Tartan Week and mm -hmm. this idea of the mod. I think a lot of people now are really excited about this mod and you came over as this spokesperson ambassador for this movement. And we've talked about, you know, your upbringing and everything. What was the mod like in New York when you came over? 
Well, I mean, there's maybe some people that don't know what a mod is. So mm -hmm. just to, to explain, a mod is a celebration of Gaelic language and culture, and it's done through competition. So that's how I started getting into Gaelic, was that the mod came to Oban, which is my um, nearest town. And it was this week of competitive music, poetry, choirs, drama, the whole shebang. For a week, the town was filled. And um, that happens once a year in a town in Scotland. It moves around. You'll have this big, I guess it's called the Royal National Mod. It's our big festival. And then in lots of different towns or villages normally, uh, you have your provincial mods. So it's a time to go and practice for the National Mod, take part in a local level. So when we've been talking to Tartan Week um, about how to bring Gaelic into Tartan Week, because obviously Tartan Week is this huge celebration of Scottish culture, but like, I'm always there going, well, where's Gaelic? Yeah, um, yeah. What can we do to bring Gaelic in? We were, they were talking about how about we hold a singing <laughs> competition. And for me, if you're going to hold a skin competition, why not make it into a mod, which is just, it's a recognized entity. It maybe gives you the opportunity to do a wee bit more. And for the first ever mod at Tartan Week, we only held one singing competition and a few workshops the day before. So we, we started quite small, but it was an opportunity for anybody. Didn't matter who you were, where you came from. If you could make it to that venue on that day, you could take part by performing and mm. It was amazing. We had such yeah. a lovely time and we kept two quite different audiences nearly on both days. We had the people that came who wanted to learn a bit about language, culture on the first day. And then we had some of them appearing on the second day, but not all. On the second day, it was people who wanted to perform in Gaelic. And for some of them, they were, you know, they'd competed before, they competed in Gaelic song competitions before. Others, that was their first time singing in public ever in any language and <laughs> it was just really nice we had a lovely day it felt very Gaelic very Highland it felt very natural and I guess my job was sort of running things behind the scene but also I was the MC I was kind of keeping things going and just reassuring everybody because I've I competed for years in the mod I know how Sometimes intimidating it can be when yeah. you're standing up there for the first time performing and it's a competition. So the comfier you can make people, the sort of more warm the atmosphere can be. And obviously you've been to Tartan Week, you know it's, it's like a big family anyway. Everybody yep. knows each other, everybody's very supportive. So yeah, we had a lovely um, experience. And it just, it was really inspiring, I think, to see Gaelic really genuinely feeling alive and feeling relevant and part of Tartan Week in New York, which is such a yeah. huge multicultural city. Anyway, I just think it, if, for me, and I know I'm biased, but I thought it fitted <laughs> perfectly. I love it. I mean, so honestly, if we can unpack that a little bit, I'd love to learn some of this because I mean, obviously there's, there's a competitive structure, but you brought up tradition with pop music and you know more <laughs> modern stuff. So inside of the mod, are there different categories? Are can you do you have to just go traditional? Is it a hybrid? What's that look like? I mean, it, it depends. It's a week of competitions. So you have different competitions in different days. It's all more traditional leaning. So mm. a lot of the competitions have prescribed songs and you sing that song as it is prescribed. And choir competitions, you'll maybe have one prescribed piece and that you're given the music, you interpret that, you you do that. These are all in Gaelic. They're all in the traditional style. Mm -hmm. Then you might have a chance to do another arrangement. Everything is in Gaelic, but it might be that it has a slightly funkier lean to it. It's definitely rooted in tradition. Nothing is too far away from that. It's not like you're really getting rap or <laughs> rock and roll or anything like that. It's all, it's all traditional leaning. But it's now, I would say it's starting to look at, particularly for maybe the choral or the folk group competitions or the singing with accompaniment, that's maybe being a wee bit more progressive now. That's probably where you'll see the different styles coming in or different influences coming in, which I think is really exciting. I do a lot with Gaelic choirs. Um, and yeah. I'm always telling everybody how great Gaelic choirs are. Singing in a choir is just, is good for the soul. There's yeah. something about like making music with other people, but... Um, I think physically, if you're singing, you're producing that sound. Yeah. So you have to really tune into everybody else. It's not about soloists. It's not about 
being the best singer it's about working as a team um I yeah. love choral singing and, and that's coming from somebody who you know I did solo singing I do a lot of performing myself but I really enjoy choral singing and it's probably the same with band work as well you have to you know you've got to work with everybody to be as tight as you can but I love mm -hmm. now particularly the choral the Gaelic choral side what people are doing it's exciting because everything we do is a cappella. um and then for the first time this year they were like oh shall we try an accompanied choral competition? And there's just one. So there was one yeah. competition this year that they were like, right, we'll give that a wee go. So I think there are opportunities to, to grow and to try different things. And we're all very supportive of each other. Although you go into a competition, you would love to, obviously love to win. But yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. if you don't win, it's going to be one of your friends that wins. So, you know, yeah. it's quite a nice atmosphere and I love it it's my favorite week of the, of the year I see everybody that I haven't seen quite often for most of the year I never sleep um, mm. I'm a broken lady at the end of it <laughs> but in the best way it's always so good so you know I, yeah go ahead Stu I was just gonna say so obviously these competitions the choral competitions everything's all steeped in history but would you say the choral side of it is where people could maybe push it a little bit further maybe across the line as opposed to being steeped in you know the traditional side of it yeah i mean it's all in gaelic so people yeah. are maybe performing new songs but they all okay. tend to be uh, yeah you they're, they're recognizable well, either in gaelic but they're probably recognizable more of a gaelic style but i think when you start adding instrumentation or part singing it does give you that option okay. whereas if you're singing on your own it's a trickier one and yeah. um most of the time we are working with older, not always, but most of the time working with older material because there's so much out there that's amazing. And yeah. it's not saying that you can't do a new song. You totally can. But actually, you quite often don't need to because you can get so many songs and you can do, you know, you can make them, if you want them to make them more contemporary, you can add accompaniment or you can play around with them. But I just think there's something for everybody and it's the one opportunity that doesn't matter who you are where you've come from you can take part you can compete um, and I think that's really important and I know a lot of people are like oh we need to have more music festivals which are great but that is only a select amount of people that are performing mm. at a festival everybody else is yeah. coming as a spectator whereas for me what I think is the real strength about a mod is that anybody can take part if you think I would really like to do something you can do that. You can learn yeah. a piece. You can learn some poetry. You can learn an instrumental piece. You can be part of that bigger experience. And I, as somebody who grew up not being a Gaelic speaker, you know, not coming from an island, um, I remember being told I did not have any Gaelic pedigree, um, <laughs> which I feel was a bit harsh, but there you go. Like that was the place for me. That was how I got started because I could go and do that. And I think you need to have that type of opportunity. And I know it's a competition, but for me, I didn't care if I, if I won or if I didn't. It was a singing yeah. opportunity, and that was really yeah. important. So you were at Tartan Tart Week, not, sorry, Mark, you were at Tartan Week not so long ago. Where, mm -hmm. where else has this taken you, this this career? Where, where else in the world has it taken you? I mean, I've been really lucky. I always kind of say, <laughs> have Gaelic, will travel. Um, that I will go anywhere. And I've been, obviously been to the States and Canada. I've been to Japan, did a tour in Japan, wow. and to New Zealand, a lot of places in Europe. Um, because I think people probably out with Scotland sometimes appreciate your culture and your heritage maybe more than they do in Scotland yeah. and I think you can go if you go somewhere who has I guess there's, there's the two sides there's the places that you'll go who have their own culture and heritage and they appreciate what you've got because they understand oh well this is our language and this mm -hmm. is our heritage we can we can see that and then you go other places that maybe don't have their own localized heritage so they are really they are i guess identifying with the fact that you have that like if you go to the states for example people are telling you they're scottish because it's yeah. like their relations were scottish because that is maybe their closest cultural heritage so that's appreciated um in that way so i think there's always something you can identify with um yeah. whereas sometimes a hard sale actually can be in scotland where you're like no no no, like this is relevant this is our culture this is our heritage we should appreciate this a wee bit more yeah, yeah. No, I, get it. I mean me me, me oh, sorry me and uh, mark you know I, we've got culture and traditions and ceremonies that we've we've done all over the world and it, you know i think mark will agree it's it's the same you know 
it's sometimes it's harder to pump, uh, push it in your own country where you go abroad and people love it and they want to get involved and know more about it. And it's an easy sell where sometimes in your own country, it's a little bit harder. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, well, and what's interesting, we had a very interesting discussion about this uh, in the army, especially with the old guard. And we talked about this romanticized idea, right? So if something is not in your day to day, psychologically, it's it's kind of exotic, right? It becomes this yeah. romanticized exotic thing because it's not going down the street to your local grocery store. It's not turning on the radio or whatever you hear the normal tunes. It's something unique and it, it either triggers a memory or it triggers something else. That you go, well, I want to be a part of that. And this yeah. idea of the mod where you're saying the inclusivity of this, where the amount of people who can come in and just be a part of it, regardless of the level there's an interesting structure there because because mm-hmm. it's a competition, it means bring your best self, right? Yeah. Regardless at what level you are. And I love that about this because when you talk about the tradition, you're talking about typically older generations that gave us the tradition we have today. But I love your mindset about including these little pieces mm. to keep it fresh because now you're introducing, yes, regarding the older generation, the current generation, the next generation, you've now captured the minds of all of these people that love just their own heritage and their own tradition. So part of me is also, you have several albums out and I think you have a new album that just came out recently. Is that correct? I do indeed, um, which is quite exciting because I mean, I do a lot of different, I work with a lot of different musicians. I work with a lot of different styles, but specifically for this album, I decided, yeah, let's do something really different. And mm. I come a lot of the time as a Gaelic solo singer and people talking about that romanticism. That's what folk like. They like Outlander. They like Celtic women. That idea that I'm on standing on a cliff edge, you know, with hair billowing and it's all very romantic. And they want you to sing a, a, a old, sad song. And that is great. And there's absolutely a place for that, without a doubt. And I love the old, sad songs. They're some of my particular favourite. But actually... What I also love is a wee bit of a dance, a wee bit of a party. And you think, well, why can't it also be fun? Why can't it also be funky? And actually, I love um, absolutely, I can sit for hours listening to an acapella, unaccompanied galaxy again, until the cows come home. I would love that. But also, I love drums and I love bass and I like something I can dance to and have a party with. And I thought, you know what? Why not do an album where I'm taking in some of my favorite musicians that are just friends I really really like Mm -hmm. and let's get together and see if we can take these songs and still keep the ethos of the song you don't want to rip the guts out of a song and turn it into something it's not necessarily but still being sympathetic to the lyrics and the the feel of the song but why can't you add instruments and why can't you make a bigger sound and particularly when you start talking about music festivals it's an interesting one because this kind of high octane is the phrase you hear again and again and again. I, they want to fill a stage and they want to have this this idea that you can be in front of a big audience, a big crowd, and they will get something out of that. And particularly as a Gaelic singer, I mean, I have people who just say, we don't do Gaelic. And mm. I think, but why? Why don't you do Gaelic? Because they yeah. are thinking that won't connect with my audience. But I go, well... People aren't sometimes listening for the words. They're listening for the feel. They're listening for the beats. They want something that they can get into, which is why if you don't have any songs, if you don't have any lyrics, people still get something out of that. So I thought, well, let's see if we can try and create something that we love musically, but also maybe will lend itself a wee bit more to a larger stage and and have quite a different feel. And there will be traditionalists that don't like it. And that's okay, because maybe this is not for them. Uh, right. So we had a ball just putting together this kind of Gaelic party album that um, I'm really proud of, actually. I think we, we were happy with how it all came together. I've worked with a really lovely group of folk, and it's just a, a real pleasure now to get the opportunity to perform material, which is just fun. Yeah. So you're talking about your performing. What are some of your most memorable moments in your in your career so far? Is there anything that stands out as is, is like a meaningful, meaningful or something that really strikes a chord with you? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ones uh, for lots of different reasons. And there's definitely something about being able to perform with a a big ensemble that Mm. is, you know, 
particularly if it's a band that's amazing and actually in, in different ways you could have a small really select audience some of my favorite performances are actually when you're in a very small village hall you may be singing a cappella. there's not there's no mics there's nothing it's all acoustic it's all locals everybody's singing along in the choruses it feels really special and that can be sometimes some of my favorite performances but if you said to me like what is the one that sort of sticks out in your mind probably it would have been when I, I was asked to put together a choir so we could represent Scotland at Eurovision. Well, co the choral version of Eurovision. And yeah. um, the Eurovision Song Contest is something I've been obsessed with since <laughs> I was a wee. Before it was fashionable and before anybody else was into it, I loved Eurovision. <laughs> Um, I used to make scorecards that I forced my family to do. Um, when Riverdance came that year that Riverdance came in, I forced my siblings, I have brothers, I forced them to reenact Riverdance in our living room. And I was Michael Flatley. I made my brothers be Jean Butler so we could do all this. You know, Eurovision for me was something I really, really loved. So to find out that there was a version of a choral version of Univision. Well, I mean, that was my boy because I was like, I love choirs and I love Univision. <laughs> and then to be able to hand pick and put together a choir and put together a Gaelic medley that would represent Scotland and be broadcast in 10 countries wow. throughout Europe was just mind blowing. Yes. And um, we were, I felt so honored and lucky to be able to do that and we worked really hard you know that that choir they grafted to put in quite a short space of time really something together that we were really proud of but actually we had such fun the mindset was we are going to go into this and we are going to work as hard as we can so we're going to do our the best performance win or lose it doesn't matter we're going to go out do the best performance that we can but we're going to enjoy it and we're going to just do our best. We're not going to take it too seriously. We're not going to let it ruin the the, the fun and the excitement. Yeah. And we did that. I had the best trip with some of my favorite people. And it it was just, I'm, I'm not, I come from a girl. We're not overly emotional. But we came <laughs> off that stage and my friend looked at me and he started to cry and I started to cry. We were like cuddling each other afterwards. And I went out the room and I saw the whole choir crying in front of me. <laughs> and it just was one of the most special performances uh, with a really lovely group of people. We didn't win, but that didn't matter yeah. because we um, we met so many lovely people and we were definitely like the party choir without a doubt. We were, we were there to enjoy ourselves, but we took it seriously. We'd put the work in. So yeah. it was just a really special experience and one that I feel very, very lucky to be involved with. That's incredible. I love it. So, I mean, you've traveled around the world. You have albums. You've talked about the ensemble aspect about this as well. And so from a classical side, so classical versus traditional side, if you were to encourage someone to get involved with Gaelic, how would you encourage them to start? I mean, you don't need any training at all to, to I think, particularly, I'm a singer. And I always say to people, e why not sing? Because the great thing about singing is you don't need any instruments. All you need is your voice and your ears, really. You have to be able to listen and replicate. And actually, I started singing in Gaelic before I knew any Gaelic. I didn't speak Gaelic. Right. And you don't need to. You just need to be able to listen. And we had a, a woman who lived in our village who was from Isla, one of the wee Inner Hebrides islands. And she taught us phonetically. She would say the sounds and we would repeat them. And we just parrot fashioned them back. And we all did that. We used to go to her house on a Monday after school. Everybody together that wanted to learn from um, from the wee primary school, wee village primary school. And we did it that way. And actually, if you're a musician, if you're an instrumentalist already, it's a really easy swap that you can learn tunes and you can learn accompaniments and, and you know, that, that sort of works. But actually, if you're just somebody that thinks, oh, I'd love to get involved, but I can't play or I can't read music or I can't speak Gaelic, you don't need to. You just right. need to be willing to to listen and give it a go. And I always say that to people like, oh, I don't sing, then I can't sing, or oh, I don't speak Gaelic. Like, you don't need to. Just come in. If you are willing to give something a go, we can mm -hmm. get you doing something. So and does re does rehearsal include whiskey? I mean, if you need something <laughs> to lubricate the vocal cords, uh, <laughs> that's fine. I always say I'm happy for it. After the hard work is done, go away, knock yourself out, do whatever you want. But uh, it's definitely good for the confidence 
without a doubt afterwards um some of the songs particularly choral songs i would say i learned half my choral repertoire in the pump it was wow. the post competition at pre ski let's all get together and particularly their gale rural choirs we mm. are really good for just getting together and singing they Tell you it's me. there's something about it's funny that the kind of bigger more i want to say formal the city choirs i don't think are so good at that kind of just get together where there's the rural choirs you see somebody you know we sing and it's funny you can be in a in a pub in somewhere that is just a total or you could be on a bus or you could be or we have been on a plane it doesn't really matter you are somewhere and you're having a conversation all of a sudden you hear somebody singing and your conversation stops you don't even say excuse me like that conversation drops you join in you <laughs> sing then when it finishes you go back to your conversation you know we are rent a mob um but there's something re- that's what i love that that it does again it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter where you come from it doesn't matter if you're really very good or not like we all just get in there we do it together and that's my favorite part i love that kind of post event sing along and it doesn't matter if it's in your living room or out in the streets or <laughs> anywhere like it's just fun I love it. That's incredible. So, Joy, you, you, you've been a great ambassador for uh, Gaelic music and, and what have you, and the traditions and customs that come with it. How do you see it moving forward in the future and, you know, beyond Scotland and the rest of the world? I mean, I think it, you just want to see everything grow and people making their own opportunities as well. And I think maybe not coming from the traditional background, I realised quite early on that I was going to have to make a lot of my own opportunities because they weren't necessarily there. Or if you've grown up in that um, community, you know people, you know how to, I guess, maybe get opportunities. I didn't have any of that. It was very much like if I want to sing, like nobody's going to come to me and say, oh, would you like to sing? Because they don't know who I am. They don't, mm. uh, they don't maybe necessarily recognize me in that way. So I had to do an awful lot myself. And actually, that was great. It gets you... It's a harder way to do it. It's a definitely yeah. got to slog a bit more, but it means that you can make things happen. And I think whether it's music or whether it's language or particularly with social media now, you really see folk going out there and being like, oh yeah, I can make a Gaelic TikTok account or I can start to um, put together a new band or like we decided, well, I say we, it was mostly, mostly me and a, and a couple of nice people that sort of agreed to work with me, but we were like, why is there not a week where Gaelic is recognised globally. Um, because we have the mod, which is amazing. And as I said, my favourite week in the year, where it's very much like a music language event. But I was like, why is there no week where Gaelic is recognised? And in Ireland, they have Shaka na Gaelica, which is like their week of Irish. In Cape Breton, they've got Mia Sin and Gael, which is like the month of the Gales. Like, why don't we have anything like that? So we just decided to start <laughs> Shaka na Gaelic, or World Gaelic Week, as we've been calling it. And just go for it, really. We were like, right, okay, we're going to set up this week. We're just going to choose a week and we are going to try and organize events and encourage other people to do their own events to take part in this week, whatever they are in the globe in whatever way works for them. And yes, we managed to get a wee bit of funding from Borscht and Gallic um, to make that happen, which we're very, very grateful for. But actually, sometimes it's just doing something. It's yeah. actually just deciding if you want to make something happen, do it. Tra- call in your contacts, encourage other people to to take part. And you don't need to wait for other people to create opportunities. And I think that makes sense for everything. It doesn't have to just be language and culture, particularly when you're dealing maybe with a minority language and culture, whereas the opportunities p- possibly don't come so easily. If you think, well, I'd love to perform here. Right, okay, organize that event. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'd love a festival to be here. You start that festival. Start yeah. small, but do it yourself. And I think that, um, for me, has proved to be really, really important. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Or do not be afraid to call on other people. Like, oh, why don't you do something? And they can yeah. as well. And it's the world is actually very small. And people are very nice and helpful. And it does make a difference when you think, actually, you're so much stronger when you start to do stuff together, I feel. So, yes, yeah. yeah, it's, it's quite exciting when you... I think there are lots of opportunities out there, particularly with social media, particularly with just technological advances too, that yeah. actually, you know, people can make their own music in their living room now. They don't need to go to a, a fancy recording studio you don't need money you don't you just need to be like oh i'll, I'll do this and and you can reach anybody now the fact that we were able to do this 
I think it's really exciting. So yeah, I just I just would like to see more. More is more is my um, attitude to a lot of things. Like, why not? What what harm is it going to go out there? Be brave. Try and do new stuff. Yeah, no, I agree completely. This is amazing. I enjoy you are an inspirational human being. You're a woman leader and not to be theatrical about it, but I mean, you're just, you're, you're a force of nature and your heart is humble. You're super talented and you have a nine-year-old little boy over in uh, Washington, DC, who is a huge fan of yours. So my nine-year-old son was listening to your new album and he could hear the percussiveness in in the vocals and he loved it he would drum along to it in the back of the car and so you've got i mean honestly fans from all over not just because of your musical talent which is incredible but you know when i got to meet you in new york and just hear how you treat others how you view the world i mean you truly are making an impact in people's lives and i think that's what this is all about we all do this because we all see the greater the greater good that can be out there and so I know that you have a new album. I know that you're pushing the mod. We're talking about education. There's a lot of things you and I have talked about offline yeah. also about just, you know, how can we help support the next generation? If people want to find out more about what you're doing, how can people follow you or look you up? Um, check my social media and my website. It's just joydunlop.com. And I'm pretty much Joy Dunlop across all social media. But yeah, please do get in touch. And what you're saying is very kind. Um, it's uh, It feels a bit weird to hear because I don't think I'm actually doing anything <laughs> particularly special. I got an awful lot of help from others. You know, people were very generous with their time and their skills and their encouragement when I was growing up. And I think that's why it's really important for me that I support. Like I still, I go home when I can and sing at Kayleigh's. I help out at events when I can because that was what people did for me. They gave me the opportunities, particularly when I was younger. And you know, we had a wee folk group with um, youngsters that were, weren't very good at first, but we, we got per performing opportunities or we got people who went, I'll teach you these songs or I'll give you this, I'll show you that. Um, and I think it's really important that we help each other and we all work together because you are much stronger in that way but what I'm doing I'm lucky enough that I can kind of turn it into a job now I've basically got all my hobbies and the things that I like doing and turned it into a job but there's been people for years who've been doing all of that for nothing you know have been doing that in their own time they've been putting in that graft and you know I look at my mum and dad who are ever who don't speak Gaelic. Mum's got a bit. She's learned a wee bit, but we'll do everything. They're at every event. They're organising stuff because they love it and they get an awful lot out of it. And I think they they taught us growing up how that how to I guess give back. Um, whether it was like they had us flogging. I'm a great raffle ticket seller. I will take the last penny in your pocket out of you if it's for a good cause. Um, and it was kind of like you were expected. You know, if you went to an event that you helped tidy up when you when it finished, that you put away the chairs or you made sure that if there was a tea that you helped serve that you helped clear up. You know, it was very much a community effort. And mm -hmm. I think get, having that when you grow up, that is a, sort of inbuilt into you. And now. I look at that when I'm, um, from what I'm doing, it was like, can I, for example, we did our album launch recently. I was like, can I get a support act? Um, and I got a sort of support act of youngsters that were, um, they were coming together to do that because that's the kind of opportunities that I needed when I was younger. I needed somebody to go, oh, would you like to come and sing at my event? And it was really nice to see kind of a, it was three, they weren't young, young, they were, you know, just starting out their professional career and they were like oh I think we're going to be a wee band now we're going to keep on after this because they really enjoyed working together and that's lovely to be able to to give back in that way because that was how I got started I was very much reliant on folk helping me and um you know just working together to make things happen so it's amazing, amazing the goodwill that is out there and the people who are really working so hard to make things happen and who are happy to support because you know we all do it for the greater good you do it yeah. because yeah. it's it helps that but also like I get an awful lot out of it everything that I do you know, people are going oh you're so busy I don't know how you do it all I'm thinking because it's fun like <laughs> I'm not sleep yes I'm busy yes I'm working but I'm also enjoying this an awful lot and at some point somebody's going to say to me no you need an actual job but until they do, I'm going to keep doing it. I keep trying to do all these things. And uh, yeah, it's um, it works both ways, I think. I love it. All right, Joy. So you have this new album. What's the title of the new album? What does it mean? 
So the album's called Kud, which is like a spark of energy or a flame or a surge. And um, I wanted something that wasn't too hard to see, but also that kind of gave that idea of, you know, fun and excitement and... Yeah, I, I did do that thing that a lot of Gaelic singers do where we read, I read the dictionary to find uh, a word that worked. And I saw this and I was like, well, that just, it embodies that kind of excitement and surge that I wanted. So yeah, we got there eventually. I love it. And so where can people find that album? You can find it at www.joydunlop.com or if you use Bandcamp, it's there. Or if you're a streamer, it's on all the, the normal. Um, it's on Spotify, it's on Apple Music, it's on all of them. And yeah, or social media. I'm basically everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you are taking over the world and it's amazing. I love it. Gal- we, basically, we're like the sort of Trojan horse here. It's a Gallic <laughs> takeover is coming and we're just letting you into the secret so you can be prepared. <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, Joy, I cannot say thank you enough for this incredible, incredible conversation. I've learned a ton. Stu, I'm sure you've learned a ton. Yeah, I mean, these mods sound amazing. I I feel like I want to go and attend one now because it it sounds like it's just such a a friendly family environment that, you know, people get on. And so, yeah. I love love a mod. I'm I'm a big, you know, team mod fan. And it's just... (laughs) I think it's got something for everybody, which is, yeah. is really special. And because it goes around lots of different venues, you see so much of the the, the country and you just have to start one in your village now. Get going. <laughs> Manchester. Right. Um, do you know, you laugh though, but I have been um, to Manchester a couple of times to sing because there used to be a branch of Uncommon Gaelach, who the organisation that run the mod used to be in uh, Manchester. So I used to quite often sing in Stockport. When oh. they used to come down to uh, their Kayleys because there was quite a, a a good going group there for a while. So it is not as silly an idea as you think. Well, so the British Drum Company is their fa- their factories in Stockport. That's where it's based. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hmm. Uh-huh. So many plans coming together. We got an idea, I think, folks. Well, thank you again, Joy, so much. Stu, thank you again for helping co-host again. This has been a fantastic episode. And folks, check out the Washington Tattoo Podcast episodes. This will come out uh, later on in 2023. But we're super excited, honestly, for what's going to happen next because Joy is now part of the Washington Tattoo family. And when that happens, it gets exciting. So folks, please be on the lookout for new and exciting events. And Joy, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very, very much for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, everyone. This is Mark Riley again. We want to share a great opportunity with you to get your business name out to our listeners. We are looking for individual episode and yearly sponsors for the Washington Tattoo Podcast. So if you love music, history, and want to support military veterans, please take this step with us and consider being a sponsor. For information on that, please email marketing at thewashingtontattoo.com.